I think when you're growing up, especially when you're a teenager, and you could probably remember this better than I because you're a bit younger than me, but um, <laughs> there are certain things that happen in your life. A lot of things happening as you're, you're maturing as a teenager. And of course, um, when uh, in the early 60s, this was the beginning of what we used to call a teenager because it wasn't a word that was used in the 50s. It suddenly became a relevant word for, a, for, the, for that generation. Um, you know, as the, as the music sort of exploded into our lives in the sort of late 50s, early 60s, um, I don't know how far you've gone back with your musical journey, but there was a lot going on then. And I think it affected um, us. Uh, and I'm talking about, when I say us, I mean my generation, not everybody, but some of us, it, it was a profound, it was a very profound um, moment. Uh, it was brimming full of energy. It was brimming, brimming full of ideas um, about how we were as, as young people in the world. I mean, it, it sort of, for me, it really, as I say in the book, it really excited me and I couldn't really get away from it. And I still haven't got away from it now, even though I'm 72 years old. It feels a bit weird to even think about that, but I still get very excited when I hear a piece of music or re-listen to a piece of music. Um, so I think it's, it's something that's uh, had a profound effect on that generation. And I still think it's important now. I think when you start listening to music, I don't know when you started really um, a bit getting very interested in different kinds of music um but for most of most children most teenagers it happens between the ages of sort of well really between 12 and 18 i suppose some younger because there are some uh, music uh, people who uh, appeal to very young children which of course we're not really talking about that that's something else altogether but um I think it still has a profound uh, emotional impact on a lot of uh, people growing up. And I think it's a very, it's the one thing that actually makes you want to join in and get involved in trying to make music. I think, um, I don't think that's, I don't think that's changed. I think that's still the same thing. Is that making sure. any sense? Sorry. It, it's a bit of a long answer to us. No, <laughs> no, it does make sense. And the thing that, kind of came to my mind as well and you talked about your parents and the lives that they lived is yeah. uh, in the 50s prior to that you had the war and you had uh yeah uh, work was much more work there's uh yeah. Yeah. less of time off and vacation and things so it seemed to be that perfect storm so to speak where there was this emotional outlet as well yeah. as the war was over there's yeah more financial stability and exactly. um, yeah. so it exploded that way the music i think i think you're putting your finger on it, actually i think those and i do mention this in the book because i think it's relevant my parents went through a, 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 a life-changing experience with the war they were separated for four or five years and in that time my mother had my elder brother richard and so my father when he came back from the war was faced with a four-year-old who we'd never met yeah and uh you know that work was as you quite rightly say work was uh a much more organized and understood uh a, a, a philosophy than it is now now we work has so many different elements to it how people actually make a living if you like or survive then it was you know you got up at eight o'clock in the morning you're in the office at nine o'clock or you're in the factory at eight o'clock and you worked all the way through you had half an hour for lunch you had two weeks off a year maximum and a few banked holidays, you know, like uh, Labor Days or something like that. Mm -hmm. But it was it was it was pretty strict. And I think that teenager thing, what was happening when I was growing up in the 60s, we were sort of escaping from that. Those ties. You're right when you say that there was more money around, because, you know, when I was growing up in the 50s, things were very, very tight. There was still rationing going on. You could only have a certain amount of sugar a week or a certain amount of bread a week. So everybody was making their own bread and things, you know, I mean, it's uh, very different now, very different indeed. How long did the rebuilding go on in England after the bombings and things? 
I, I've got a feeling it's still, I think it's still going on. It's still going on. Well, and I, I say that rather glibly, but um, uh, it, you know, Britain was kind of scarred um, right. by all that bombing that was going. I mean, London was a lot of London had to be completely rebuilt. I mean, we've got a small news house in London where we we go once or twice a week when we go up to town and uh all around there is completely new buildings that were built in the 50s and the 60s which because they were the whole area was bombed out so a lot of those lovely old houses were brought down streets were brought down a lot of people died i mean oh yeah we kind of forget that the the blitz was a pretty horrendous business i mean worse for the germany because i mean it's, it's probably we probably shouldn't go into it because wars are just horrendous things they should never start and they should you know that people should really just think about that before they start another one um they never really sold anything um and uh yeah i mean i think i, I think it's it took quite a while for, for for britain to rebuild itself and i think when i say it's still doing that i mean i think that obviously industries have changed we were making different things then but I don't think we've really, I don't know. I mean, I'm probably, I've probably gone off on a tangent, which I don't really understand myself, but um, I feel that uh, these scars run very deep. And I remember my father literally refused to buy um, a German car or a Japanese car. Yeah. Um, oh, that was in the States too with, yeah, I mean, that, and yeah. You think now you think, oh my God, well, that's crazy because they were actually, they're the best, <laughs> they're the best cars that were made. <laughs> uh, anyway, that's, that's a bit of a sideline really. Sure. Well, it's just the older I get, you know, I loved all the Brit rock and the older I get, I'll listen to these interviews and they talk about growing up around the rubble and stuff. And that's something yeah. that as I get older that I put together that when I was young, I just listened to the music and it was whatever, but it's just such a different dynamic. Cause you know, my grandpa was in world war II and things like that, but we didn't have yeah. that uh, dynamic in our own country. And that way that Britain no, it was, it was further from your shores, wasn't it? Yes. But um, yeah. yes, it's, I, I, yes, it's, it was a, it's it's bound to i mean i think this i think that what's happened in the world in the last couple of years for instance with this uh, pandemic thing that's going to leave a lasting scar on quite a few people yes and and, and uh, you know a, a lot of the stuff that i wrote in the on this record was relating to how one was feeling right now, you know, because I wrote a lot of it during lockdown um, and there wasn't really much else to do, to be honest. So I thought, sure. well, I might as well write down what I'm feeling. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a quite a bit of that on there, to, trying to understand what's happening. And, and of course we have no idea the long-term effects of, of, of this situation uh it, it it's it's profound and and i don't think we've really seen the the effects of it apart from the obvious people dying i mean that's the biggest the most obvious effect but there's a psychological effect which i think is going to uh last for quite a long time yeah absolutely yeah. Sorry, so kind of, it's, yeah absolutely mm. kind of with that what was um, your parents' perception, especially when like Dire Straits was at their height to just see you live all through that and all they lived through? Well, that, that, that's, a, it's a, that's a good question, actually, because I, I, I was really until the band kicked off, my parents was slightly worried about me, I think, if, uh, to put it mildly, because I wasn't really doing what they would have liked me to have done, uh, you know, I tried getting a steady job, which was fine for two or three years, but it didn't really suit me. I, did, I always had this sort of nagging thing in the back of my mind that I, I really should be a musician and, and, and just finding the right people to play with was, you know, wasn't easy. Uh, but when the band kicked off, 
And the first thing my my mother said was, "Oh my God, now he's joining a rock and roll band. What is going on?" <laughs> you know, it's like, "Oh hell, what's next?" You know, sort of thing. And um, but then, of course, uh, when they realised that it was it was something, it was becoming something quite important. For well, certainly for me initially, but then they recognised that um, you know it was having a profound effect on the music world as well they suddenly uh became very um pleased about that and uh, enjoyed coming to the co enjoyed coming to concerts and stuff and sitting on the side of the stage which i mentioned in the book you know and sort of having their tea made by the uh, monitor engineer sure <laughs> sure that's cool yeah it was cool actually i mean funny enough i was watching a um uh an interview with dave grohl uh, last night from the foo fighters and uh he comes across, firstly, as an extremely, you know, good bloke. I must say, I really enjoyed listening to him. And um, he he came from very, very simple circumstances. You know, his mother, they, they, they didn't have much money and all the rest of it. And, you know, when he became successful, his, his mother it comes on the road with him. Oh, wow. <laughs> Which is, you know, he, he said, well, why not? I mean we get on great she loves everybody in the band they love her you know she's retired why not so they take her on the road and put her on the tour bus <laughs> <laughs> that's cool i guess you know that's kind of a, a sign of respect too just to share that with yeah with your parents and things like that and yeah uh, yeah yeah well it's the, the thing is life has a has a habit of coming around again you know things come around and if you give it time things uh start to make sense um i know i know not not everything makes sense that's a bit of a generalization but you know if you keep at what you really love doing and don't let go of it it's not like a dream it's just something that nags at you and the, and the music was nagging at me for years and and then meeting uh mark uh, was obviously a, a, a profound moment and um uh that you know, then we kicked off into this other thing, which we never knew where it was going to go. We just really loved playing together. Um, and I think that all I would all I would say is that you have to put yourself in life. You have to put yourself in a, in a place where things can happen to you. Um, and, and maybe take a few risks now and again. I'm not talking about jumping out of airplanes and doing stuff like that or climbing mountains. But I'm well, some people like to do that. But talking about just sometimes you get a choice between the safe road and the, the not so safe road. And I've always, I've always slightly taken the, the, the unsafe road because I, because I like to push myself and I'm still doing it now. I mean, I, I agreed to do something the other day, which I'm completely, it's completely absurd, but I'm, <laughs> I'm going to have a go at it. I can't tell you about it now, but anyway, but um, so I think you have to follow your gut instinct sometimes, which I I, I'm, I I get the feeling you probably do with you know with, with what you're doing now. You're you know creating this 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 podcast, this uh, this interview business that you're doing now, which is which is which is a, a good thing to do because I think you can find out an awful lot more about things by talking to people. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a songwriter and singer first, and I kind of came upon this opportunity, and I was like, "This would be a great way to engage people and learn." And um, uh -huh. so, so yeah, so here we are. Okay. But, are you, so, you, are you performing at the moment? Are you getting out and playing? I do. Yes, yes, and Ooh. I have a EP coming out in March, and so yeah, so I'm excited. Looking forward to this year, like everybody else. I think it's yeah, yeah. hopefully you know brighter skies ahead. So. Quite right. Well, send me send me a link to it so I can listen to it. I will. I definitely will. Thank you. Um, kind of like you mentioned, um, playing with the right people musically makes a huge difference. And I thought it was interesting in your book, you said with the Blind Alley band in which looked like 75 or 76, you were kicked off stage. And not long after that, you're in dire straits and you guys are, you know, killing it so do you attribute a lot of that to playing with the right people or did you practice a lot during that time or what happened there yes i i think well i mean i think that we really you, everybody has to practice if they want to get anywhere i mean it's just you doesn't it doesn't suddenly you don't wake up in the morning being able to play the guitar you have to spend quite a lot of time at it 
it, it is really a question of the getting the right people together and and then um because the, the great thing about musicians is that they they share a, a, a similar language and it might be might be rock music might be country music it might be folk music might be reggae it might be whatever but they all share this language and once you've went as you being a song singer songwriter yourself you'll know that once you know a few chords you can play quite a few things because a lot of a lot of the greatest songs are quite simple so you can actually feel part of the of that of that um of that group of people which is which is lovely you know and um i think that uh, meeting the right people is absolutely essential if you if you and you you know when you've met them let me put it that way and i pl I'd, I'd played with an awful lot of people before uh i met mark and david and we and we and we and we started playing together and I, i played with a lot of people so i knew that when i we started playing together this was something different and it had uh, a little bit of magic about it which of course it, i think uh, uh, one doesn't one doesn't really know completely let me get that right john for a start no one doesn't really know but you have a feeling that it might be good and um you know mark was writing uh, in in the in the flat there bits and pieces and i thought oh he's not just a, good, a great guitar player he, he can actually he can write a he can write a pretty good song too and he wrote this thing called Sultans of Swing. And I thought, now that's, that's quite, that's, that's quite a, that's, that's quite a major moment. Yeah. And it was just really reminded me of, you know, songwriters and, and, and writers generally, they're, they're just great observers of what's going on in the world. And then you've got to put it down. So somebody else gets it. That's the trick. You can observe it, but you've got to first of all, you've got to observe it, then you've got to write it down, and then you've got to communicate it to as many people as possible in a way that they get it too. It's a bit like painting a picture. I mean, you probably know that I do a bit of painting as well. Yeah. And that's a, that's another communication tool which I really love. And if some if just one person comes into a gallery where I've got a picture on the wall and goes, I really like that, I just go, thank God for that. Somebody likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, because I do think you're right. That's part of the point. You are trying to communicate with people. That's why you're not just storing it all in your closet or something. You you want to get it out there to say something. And exactly right. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly and Sultans right. was more of an acoustic based song when it was first brought to you. Is that right? Yes, it was. But neither Mark or I can remember um, <laughs> what it was like. I think it was more kind of folky, but uh folky country type thing and in a sense actually it has got some sort of country sort of style to it in a way but then when the band started playing it it kind of kicked it off into something else so um yeah you never you just never know i mean you you can start with one idea and it can turn into a you know i, I know from songwriting myself i start with the germ of an idea and by the time it's finished it's it's something quite different sure absolutely yeah. Um, and then, so with, with that, you took your, your grandmother's money. She left you after she passed, I believe if that's correct. Yeah. And that was what got the band recorded and what got the band on the radio. So you had a lot of faith in what was going on then. Well, by that time we had four or five, um, very what I thought were very strong songs and we really needed to in those days if you wanted to get people to listen to what you were doing you didn't have the internet you couldn't just send a link or whatever you had to actually go and record something and put it on a on a tape uh whether it be a cassette tape or a reel-to-reel -reel tape and and give it to somebody there was no other way of doing it so you had to you had to actually go and make the thing and and get it on something physical and then and then take it to somebody for them to play and so we, we you know that so that we had to we had to record these songs and i suddenly came into this money and i said well why don't we use this cash to um you know go and record what we've what we've been playing for the last sort of few months 
And uh, so, I mean, literally we did the whole, we just, I think five or six songs in, in a weekend, just, you know, just literally went in and played them and uh, recorded it very simply. And then, and, and then this, this DJ that I knew, he put it on the radio and then, and then all hell broke loose. So you, you, sometimes, you just don't know. I mean, we just thought Sultans was a pretty good song, but obviously other people thought it was something else. Um, and so, you know, things went, things did go a bit mad quite quickly. And uh, we had a lot of catching up to do because we were still, we didn't really know much about the music business, if you like. That's, the music business is very different from the music. Let me put it that way. You have to learn a lot of things on the way in order to survive <laughs> because we didn't have any management. We had no lawyers. We had no accountants. We had nothing. There was just the four of us. And uh, so we had, we had a lot to learn very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. And I wondered if you could maybe expand on that a little more, because I know even Mark in the forward mentions that there's music and there's the music business. Um, yes, we've always talked about that. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think, as you say in the book, too, that you guys were in a good spot because you were like 26 and not 18 or 19 or something like that. And That's should kind of yeah. step back and think a little bit. So what was yeah. that? Was that a lot of the music business trying to uh, influence the actual music or was it more in like the logistics of things? Well, I think it's more the logistics. They didn't want to influence the music at all. I mean, they were very happy with what they were hearing. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's always a good place to start. But the thing is, you are aware quite early on of this machine, if you like. And you've probably touched on it yourself in what you're doing. There's a, machi there's a machine out there which gets the music to the public. And now it, and now it is very much bus business orientated. I have to say that there was a profound change i think in the early 80s when suddenly the money men realized that there was there was money a serious money to be made out of music and suddenly it became much more corporate and i, I think we were making we were recording making movies i think in, a, in in new york when the uh the head of the company the chairman of the company who we really liked and he was a big music man. That's the reason why I was in the business. Came over to see us and took us out for a very nice supper in New York. And, and in the conversation, he said, um, they're going to let me go. And we said, what do you mean they're going to let you go? You are the bloody company, for Christ's sake. What's going on here? And he said, well, the money men have moved in. And, uh, you know, and he said, things are changing. And I'm going to be a casualty of that. And it, it never really, hasn't really recovered since then. I mean, and that, that's not to say there's an awful lot of people actually in the music business who, who do love music, don't get me wrong. But there's a very much a business element to it now, which I think uh, uh, has quite a, a big influence on what gets on the radio and what gets recorded and what kind of people get recorded and what they look like and whether they're blonde or brunette, whether they've got long legs or whether they're, a toy band or a boy band or whatever they are. You know I mean? There's, there's all this other stuff going on. Right. Uh, so it's not just simply people, you know, like you and me going and writing a few songs and, and recording them and having a bit of fun with it. It's a whole other thing now. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah that yeah. makes sense because, you know, I always thought with dire straits, one of the, the coolest things about your guys' success was, you know, like Brothers in Arms, that huge album was so musically eclectic. It wasn't really fitting a format um, and things like that. Yep. So I guess they gave you space there, it sounds like, with the songs and the recording. Well, there was never any negotiation with the record company about what we did or what we didn't do. I mean, can you imagine getting the first album, which was basically the band in its very basic elements, and then and then doing, you know, make, I mean, they communicate being made in, in, uh, in, in Nassau, very, very laid back, but similar kind of style. And Making Movies, a complete departure from the other two albums. And then Love of a Gold coming on with a 12 minute song, which of course they thought, oh my God, this is crazy. There's, that, there's, there's only five songs on this record. One of them's unbelievably slow and one's unbelievably long. And uh, so they didn't really know what they were gonna get with, with uh, Brothers in Arms. And by the time we'd got to Brothers in Arms, 
we were developing all sorts of different styles and different ways of looking at things. And so we spent a lot of time preparing and working through those songs on Brothers in Arms to get them the way that we wanted them to be. So there's a lot of um, uh, changes going on. I mean, Money for Nothing changed quite a lot in the process of getting it to where you know what it sounds like today. Something like your latest trick, which is a, a very quite a complicated chord structures and such like, and uh, you know, so th th it was a it was a, a, a interesting mix of songs on that record. And funnily enough, actually, I mentioned this in the book, the Walk of Life almost didn't get on because, wow. well, because um, you know uh, Neil Dorsman, who was producing the album with Mark, said he didn't think it fitted. Well, we said, we said, actually, we think it needs that kind of lightness of touch just to sort of level everything up. And we were right. But we didn't get, nobody told us what to do in the record company. They wouldn't have dared, I don't think. <laughs> well, that's good. That's, that's good. Yeah, Walk of Life is, that's part of, part of what I was saying. It's like this rockabilly rooted song yeah. and it's very different. And it's not just different from the album. It's different than a lot of, what was out there at the time which is it was it was exactly i mean the thing is you, you you just have to be courageous in this in this game and just do what you want to do you don't want to, you don't want to be told by other people what you should be doing i, yeah. I mean you know you it, we're only here once and you've got to sort of you've got to really be sincere to yourself and clear about what you want and if it doesn't work, well, fine. If it does work, great. If it only works a bit, great. But it, it's yours. And and yeah. and uh, I think that's the most important thing to remember. You, you're not trying to join some sort of um, club or other. I mean, we never, ever followed any trends, Dire Straits, never followed anybody else's lead. There was no sort of, you know, uh, punk stuff. There was no... Uh, you know, all that, that the glam rock in the 80s. We didn't get involved in all that. We just did our own thing, basically. Yeah. And I would encourage anybody to do that. Unfortunately, the music business, going back to them, doesn't really want you to do that. They want you to do what's, pretty much what's gone on before. They, but then, of course, if something surprising comes along, they pat themselves on the back and take the, and take the credit for it. <laughs> I was going to say, after the fact, I bet they sure don't mind once it's a hit or, or whatever. Oh, they, but, they didn't mind. They don't. They didn't mind as long. I mean, you know, they, I think the record company was quite happy with what um, the band was doing. So the first time you were in the United States was when yeah. you went to Muscle Shoals. Is that correct? Yeah, that's what is correct. Yeah, we we um, went to Muscle Shoals to mix the um, the second album, Communique, because we'd recorded it in, um, in in Nassau in a. In a, in a, in a, in, in a, it was a good studio, but I think that Barry Beckett, who was the engineer, who was very um, used to working at Muscle Shoals because he was part of the um, the team that Swampers down there, and he, he he knew the desk very well. So I think Barry and probably Jerry as well. Jerry Wexler wanted to make sure that what we got on tape was good enough. You know, and so we we I think we spent about a week or ten days in Muscle Shoals, if, I'm, if my memory serves. So I, I mean, it's quite interesting when you've never been to America before. The first place you go to is Muscle Shoals. Yeah, you know, in Alabama, um, it's <laughs> your first sight of America. Probably should be something a bit more um, grand than that. I I feel, but. Um, you know, when you sit down for breakfast and you're eating grits and such like, which we, I still don't know what they're made of. But uh, <laughs> sure, sure. Um, but it was a wonderful experience at Muscle Shoals because, um, you know, it's got this, it's got this, um, this extraordinary history history behind it. When you're in these places, you sort of feel it somehow. You 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 recognise the. Uh, uh, the place as being something where you where you could be creative, and we didn't really have to do very much, to be honest, to the to the um, to the tracks. So I think there was a bit of stuff we did. I, I can't I can't really recall um, too much about that, but um, you know, uh, it was a it was a good place to mix it anyway. I have to say, and first taste of America, you know, the 
big pickup trucks and the and uh, I think you had, we had to go across the county line to get some booze because I think that, 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 that you couldn't get booze on a weekend or something. Yeah, that's still like that in a lot of places in the south. Actually. Is it really? Uh huh. Yeah. They think that's going to stop people from drinking, do they? <laughs> <laughs> they, they think. It's, yeah, there's less and less of it, but it's still around. Even in Texas, there's some laws about on Sunday morning, you can't buy alcohol and things like that. And, but they kind of get kicked back more and more as time goes on. But it's funny, isn't it? Um, this day, um, anyway, yeah, we're trying, they're trying to take care of us, I think. I think that's the point. Yeah, yeah. Um, so had Pick and Mark been there before that to work on that Bob Dylan album? I think so, yes. I think they did do some work down there with Bob. Um, I've, I, I'm a little hazy about that because I wasn't really involved. In, I, I know that Mark went over to L.A., I think, for a bit to do some work with Bob on some of the songs. I don't know how um, productive that was, but because when they got in the studio, I think um, Bob dropped most of the songs after about two weeks of recording and started an, an, another lot, hmm. which was was um, interesting because everybody thought the first lot were quite good. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, wow. I, but I think I think that um, yeah, I think they did work in Muscle Shoals. I'm pretty sure they did because I think Jerry and, and Barry did that record with them. Yeah, I wasn't sure if that's how that connection all came about, how you guys went to mix there because Mark and Pick had already been there previously. Yeah, I think I think it was more to do with Barry, the engineer, a produ stroke producer, wanted to, uh, you know, just to be reassured by working in a place that he was used to. I see. Yeah. Gotcha. That which is sense. which is actually good because I mean we worked a lot in the power station in New York and you kind of knew what you were going to get when you worked there because it was you know seriously high quality and you could get good sound and and um, the vibe was good you know the vibe in a studio is really really important yeah um, it can some have it and some don't simple as that sure did you guys ever go into any places and just kind of say no this isn't the one and decide to pick up and move or well i think we've done stuff in some places where we did we weren't very happy with the results so we didn't use it i think there was um uh a a, i can't remember what it was exactly it was a studio i think it might have been olympic studios when we did a bit of work there once where uh, it doesn't exist anymore it was where the stones used to record um it did it didn't it didn't really do it. I think we kept a bit of it, but some of it we just wasn't working. I don't quite know why, and you never know really why. Um, I mean, we we try and we tried to go into any studio, you know, well prepared because there's nothing worse than getting in there and 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 having not worked out the drum parts or the bass parts or stuff like that. I'm not quite sure where the chorus is going to go on a song. You know, a lot of people go in there and actually work in a studio and, and write the songs, but. I think it's much better to go in prepared. I, I would recommend anybody starting out to do that. Um, yeah. You know, because you, A, you, you might change your mind while you're in there, but at least you've got a place to start, you know, and because um, when you're recording, things do change. There's no doubt about it. Right. So how did the process work in Dire Straits, starting with Mark bringing a song in, ending with recording an album? Well, it's always quite a difficult question to answer, to, to be honest. Uh, um, uh, there's a there's a lot of um, there's a lot of sort of ebb and flow between all the different musicians as things are being put together. And sometimes Mark would come. I mean, for instance, on the first album, um, you know, we 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 put the seeds of those together in in the in, in the in the council flat where we were living. Um, you know, but most of the time, Mark would come with a pretty strong idea about um, the feel of the thing or how it should, you know, he, he always had the lyrics done. That's one thing he always said. He always had the words done. I don't, I can't recall many in times when he changed the lyrics. That was always, and, 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 the, and the, often the structure was there, but sometimes we'd start work on something and um, it just wouldn't, 
come together somehow and it just happens like that so we would we would just dump it and start again on something else um but there was always a lot of um uh as i say ebb and flow people suggesting things and people suggesting other things that other people could do for instance i mean you know somebody might say oh john could you play a, a an e just before we go into the f section there or something and i think yeah that's a good idea or whatever i mean there's you know you're not very precious about i'm going to play exactly what i'm going to play and and so you 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 really what you're trying to do is get the best out of the material that you've got to work with and um you, you I, I certainly discovered quite early on that you know mark was quite an unusual uh songwriter coming at it from a completely different angle really and um it was it was really really enjoyable working those songs up i must i have i do have that that memory uh of it being a, a really wonderfully creative time uh, and, and it's very satisfying when you you know you 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 work on something and then you you put it down in the studio and you hear it back and you go yeah that sounds pretty good that works that's that works okay it's very very well you know you've done it yourself you it, it it's it's a it's a really pleasing um, moment, which yeah. you know I, I, it's and it, it, the very first time you hear yourself recorded is always quite quite a momentous moment. Um, you know, even in that little studio in in North London where we did the demos. I mean, you know, just hearing that back was uh, really exciting, very exciting. Yeah. Absolutely. It still is now, you know, when I when I get the band together and I play my stuff and go in and record something, it's still it's still great to go in there and hear it back. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, so that never goes away. Right, right. Um, you mentioned the power station. What was it like to work with Jimmy Iovine? <laughs> well, it was it was kind of it was a bit crazy. Yeah. I mean, he was he was quite uh, he, he he had a lot of energy, um, but I have to say that he was uh, he knew when something was working, which is what you want out of a producer, and you know his input was sometimes quite a lot and other times not very much. I mean he he brought Roy Bittan in from the East Street Band to do the to do the keyboards, which was great, and he had a wonderful engineer working for him, Shelley. And they, and they just come off the back of doing, um, I think, "Damn the Torpedoes" by um, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. So, um, and they were used to working at a power station. Uh, but Shelley was Shelley was the one that really spent an awful lot of time on getting the sounds right. Uh, you know, getting the sound of a snare drum right and the bass. I mean, he had me change the bass strings, God knows how many times, in order to find the right sound. In the end, we went back to the ones I already had on it. But that's you know, you sometimes you have to go through this process, which is quite frustrating. But Jimmy would come in and with fresh ears would listen to something and say, that sounds great. Or I think you should try you know, try this or try that. And you need that. You Sometimes you need that other element to come in and, and, and cut through all the times you when you're sitting there trying to work it out. And then somebody comes in fresh and says, oh, I, I, I can hear it. Maybe, you know, maybe you, you, you're not going to that chorus in the right way or something or maybe just hit it a bit harder pick you know you might did a drum roll going into that or something you know something uh but he was he was quite an exciting person to work with um he was a great character and of course he went on to great things with that with the headphone business i mean god above yeah <laughs> that's extraordinary but he was a very good producer and he, he produced a lot of people he did patty smith i think and and bruce Springsteen. he did you know, he was uh, what they call up. It was he was hot for a while. That's yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And for um, sure. you know, he, we made a very good record with him. I think making movies was a good record. Absolutely. You know, he was very excited about it because he realised that the band was having a quite a strong musical transition at this particular point. You know, the the, the songs were opening up; they were becoming much um, broader in their musical spectrum. That sounds very grand, doesn't it? But you know what I mean? It's, 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 they were developing, Mark was developing as a songwriter and the band was developing as a, as a band. 
And, uh, you know, we'd done a lot of gigs by the time we did that record. So we would, we kind of knew what we were doing a bit more. I think we weren't quite so green, I think. Yeah. And it seems like, I don't know if this is part of the reason Jimmy was brought in, but it seems like those projects with Tom Petty and Bruce Springsteen and stuff, those were big sounding records. Yeah, and that yeah, was exactly. a bigger sounding record for Dire Straits with bringing the keys and stuff in. Yeah, so yeah. was that yeah. part of the idea? We want to get a bigger sound and this guy's making bigger sounds? Yes. I think we wanted a bit more of everything, really, to put it quite simply. I think we we realized we'd, uh, I mean, in a sense, as I mentioned this in the book, the second album was made very quickly after the first one under a bit of pressure from America um, because uh, I, I, don't, I don't know whether um, Warner Brothers thought we were a one hit wonder or something, I don't know, but they wanted another record very quickly. And, and, and we, we came under quite a lot of pressure, which was, it was not very welcome to be honest because the first album was doing really well all around the world, but we didn't really need another record. We didn't need another album. You know, the, the first record was was doing very well, thank you. We didn't need another one to sort of cloud it, cloud around it. As it turns out, they both did okay. I mean, it wasn't a problem, but, um, you, you know, uh, so I think probably if we had a bit more time, Communique might have sounded a bit different. I don't know. It's, it, we'll, we'll, we will never know. All right. <laughs> we'll never know because it's all done. And in some ways, we talked about this yesterday, each album stands alone in its own right as a as a piece of work, and I think every album that one ever does sh should do that. I know it's very different now because people write a song and just put it on Spotify, and they don't really worry about maybe making a record because, in a sense, it sounds a bit old fashioned. But when you put an album together, you put an album together which somebody could put on at the beginning and listen to the whole thing and take it off at the end and go, "Yeah, that's a really great piece of work." And that I still make albums like that. I've spent a lot of time getting all the tracks in the right order, you know, uh, what, what starts the album, what finishes the album. And, and when, you, when you're doing an LP, of course, you've got to turn it over. So you have to decide what's going to start the first side and the second side, uh, which takes us back a bit. But um, anyway, I, I digress anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. But Jimmy was great to work with. <laughs> going oh. back to Jimmy. <laughs> Very cool. Yeah. Um, and it was at that point that Dave left. Is that correct? Yeah. During that album? Okay. Yes, he did. Yeah. Yeah. And I just thought it was very interesting that there was an ad put in a magazine to replace him as you guys were that, that big. And that's how, um, how was brought in. Yeah. Was that just, that was what you guys uh, thought. Let's get some totally fresh blood in here. And, or how did that go about? Well, the thing is, it's, you know, it's a big world out there with guitar players in it. And you, 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 you might, you, you could be fed all sorts of people through the system, but there might be somebody out there who, and as it proved to be, uh, Hal, um, who might be just right for the band. So you don't really know. I think you've, you, you've, in some ways, it, it hadn't happened before, so we were, we didn't we didn't really know how to approach it. I don't suppose we need a guitar player, and the guy that had, had done a bit of guitar work, um, I think it was McGuinness, Sid, Sid McGuinness, was it? Yeah, on the on making moves, he'd done a bit of work with us, some guitar parts. He he didn't he wanted too much money, I think, or something, or he, he didn't want the gig. I can't remember what it was, but so he wasn't going to do it, and. Um, and we tried a couple of people out, which didn't materialize. It's quite a big ask for somebody to come into a band like that. You know, even at that particular point, uh, as, it, as, as the band, you know, developed, it was easier to make the transition to find somebody else, you know, because, you know, how did the, how did that, um, that tour and, and um, the Love of a Gold tour as well. Um, and, you know, he's still a great friend of mine today. Uh, you know, he, 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 uh, when he comes over from the States, we spend a bit of time together. Um, I'm very fond of him. He's, he's yeah. great. He was a great, he was a great guy to work with. He was great on, he was, you know, it's, it's important when you, when you go on the road for months and months on end, you've got to have somebody who you want to sit down and have breakfast with every day. Very important. Yeah. yeah. You know. 
that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and then just one of the things I found interesting that you'd said in the book at the Roxy, I believe in other places you played to people sitting at tables. Is that correct? Yeah. Is that how it was? Yeah. 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 That's well, that was the scene. That was this John. That was the scene then in, in America. The, I don't know what they could, what they get. They went under a certain name, but they were, they were kind of big clubs where um, on that first American tour, we did 58 shows, I think, or 51 shows in 38 days. And everybody was, how the hell do you do that? Well, you do two shows a night in some places. And uh, so the first sitting would be at sort of 7.30 and they'd have, their, they'd have their burgers and what have you around their tables, have a few drinks, listen to the band. They'd all go out and then another lot would come in at 9.30 or 10 o'clock and we'd play till midnight or something. Um and that was the that was the normal thing. You you do two shows a night in those days, huh. um, and and the, most most of the clubs we played in actually the rock. I don't think the Roxy had tables actually. I, can't, I don't think it did. I can't remember now. Okay, I do remember a lot of. Uh, uh, no, I, can't, I don't think it did. But mo most of those places they 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 were in like the bottom line in New York, for instance. That was the same. That had tables and chairs. Um, uh, the old Waldorf in um, in in San Francisco. That was the, that was the same. It was pretty normal in those. I don't know whether it happens anymore in the states. I don't know. I mean, maybe they've gone these clubs, but they were great places to play because, for a start, they all had really good sound systems in, because they were used all the time, and so they could afford to put in really good sound. So it was it was it was great from that point of view. Uh, and, and of course, we did carry a, a bit of sound equipment around with us, but we didn't really didn't need to put it up because they all had it all there already. Um, that saved a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, the tables and chairs thing was kind of normal then. Is, huh. is it not happening anymore? I wouldn't say as much. No, but it does mm. make sense because if you're, you know, you're there to see the band. What you're describing seems to be more of like a show setting. And you're you're playing for the audience. I don't know if it felt that way, but yeah, it seems like much more of a listening room. You're there to listen to the band, and I do think that's lost a lot of times now. The band and the music is much more an accessory to selling drinks and whatever yeah. else. But it's the same. It's the same here, John. I mean, I think I th I personally, uh, when I go out now, I like to play in small theaters. Because we've got some great theatres around here in the UK, anything from 250 up to 750, which is a very nice size audience. And um, I played one uh, actually in the summer when we first opened up from the COVID thing. And there, I think there were 250 people in the room and that was tables and chairs. And it was a lovely atmosphere. Fantastic. You know, the, there was waitresses bringing drinks to the table and stuff. And it just felt kind of... Um, it felt like a nice warm atmosphere and I do, I do remember those gigs being apart they were very exciting but the, there was a there was a a, a great uh, relationship with the audience because they were sitting there having a nice time and you were playing some nice music to them and they, well, there's nothing wrong nothing wrong with that at all there's no there's no pushing and shoving to try and get to the front or whatever you know you've got your place and that's it yeah so I I, I think it's a, it's a shame that those have gone I mean I think we could do with more of them over here. In fact, actually, there's a, there's a place in London which I play in sometimes. It's called Nell's, and it's a place where Van Morrison plays because he because he loves the atmosphere in there, and that holds about oh maximum three hundred, I think. But the the the, one, the the ones in the front are sitting at tables and chairs. Okay, and it just gives a real nice sort of clubby atmosphere. It's much more intimate. Do you know what I mean? You can really concentrate and listen to the music. Yeah, it, yeah, it's more respectful of the music too. I, yeah, I guess. It can yeah, be, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of with that, and with the shows, you mentioned about how all the the big tours and and everything with Dire Straits couldn't have happened without a great crew. Yeah, putting yeah. all that stuff together. I wonder if you could expand on that part that people don't see as much: the crew putting the big show together. Well, this is one one of the reasons 
well, one of the things that happened when I was starting to to, to write this thing, and and uh, in a sense, you know, celebrating all the people that were involved, and I don't think people realise when they come and see a show, they don't really think about the crew. Of course, they don't because they're coming to see the band, but the crew is. Um, I can't tell you how important they are just as individuals or as a group, because when you get to, a, I mean, when we first went out on the road, we had two guys. One guy was doing the sound and humping the gear around. The other guy was doing the lights. That was it. And towards the end, we had, you know, hundreds, but they all have very specific tasks. And the bigger things get, the more interesting it gets with the, with how it all works. And every single person is a valued member you know, from the person who operates the spotlight on the on the rig to the guy that does the out front sound to one of the girls in the catering, uh, you know, who makes the breakfast. I mean, all these things are incredibly important and I can't stress it enough that, you know, when you get, when, you, when you've got a big band on the road, um, you know, and you're playing night after night, you've got to have a really amazing bunch of people behind you to make it work. I can't tell you how important it is. And you'll find... Pretty much every successful band will have great crews. I mean, it's a, it's it's incredibly hard work. I mean, I don't know how they survive on the lack of sleep they get, but somehow or other they manage to do it. And you know, the last tour we did was two hundred and fifty odd shows. I can't remember now how many it was. It was a lot of shows, and I think I think one or two crew members either had to go home from illness or somebody ill at home or something or breaking their leg or whatever. But that, that crew stuck together for all those dates. I mean, absolutely incredible. Wow. They beca yeah. It becomes this incredible, wonderful family. Yeah. And I, and I stress that in the book as well, the fact that it's, a, it's you know, you, you realise you've got two families going. You've got the, your work family, which is the band family, and then you come home to, your, to your, your wife and kids, which is your other family. And the transition is sometimes very difficult. I mentioned this in the book, and it's, it's one thing that a lot of people don't realize, you, you know, to make the transition from being on the road with all that sort of hullabaloo going on. And then you come back home and, uh, you know, you're wondering where the kettle is to make a cup of tea, you know. Sure. I know where it is now. So <laughs> you have been there long enough now. Yeah. Kind of with that, talking about the road, you talk about some <clears throat> very intense shows in Belfast kind of Eastern Bloc countries, things like that. Yeah. I mean, what was it like to, on one hand, be in this semi, you know, glamorous rock and roll band type scenario, and then you're going to these countries playing for these people that are in, you know, really not good times in their country. Did those shows feel different? I mean, I would think the music meant something different to them in a way that perhaps in the United States where it was, a show. I mean, it meant something to them, but to those people, they're having a really tough time in their country. Well, you make a good point. I mean, yes. I mean, I, I think that the, the it, it wasn't it wasn't always uh, you know as glamorous as people might want to think. I mean, some of those shows in Yugoslavia were 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 really quite um, difficult, for want of a better word. Uh, you could say complete madness, but difficult to do for the time being. And um, because, you know, th that was a country under um, enormous stress and not long after that, it fell apart, you know, and, and there was this terrible war that went on between neighbours and people, you know, they'd known each other for years. They were suddenly not liking each other anymore. It was very distressing. So you, you can be in these places, not really realise, but you get a sense that things aren't quite right. And, um, you know, playing in Israel, for instance, you know, uh, uh, that country has always been under a certain amount of stress from the people around it. And you really felt that. Uh, and it's very, it was very interesting talking to the people there, how they felt. And you got a much better idea about what was going on in that country and how uh, people were dealing with that constant day to day stress. I mean, you know, when you live in you know, a safe place like America and or the UK, you don't realise sometimes the stress that's going on in the world. Mm -hmm. 
you really don't you, you don't get it and and in some ways we well, didn't go to some places because you literally couldn't find a promoter uh who could do it properly on that scale so in a sense you only went to those places where you could actually put a show on properly and um make it work i mean the i mean the the early italian shows that we, which you might yeah. be probably referring to <laughs> were um yeah, they were quite interesting. Yeah, it seems like some <laughs> of them you kind of you go into it thinking it won't be as bad as bad as it is, and then you get there and it is, but you're committed and you're there and you have yeah. to do something. Yeah, you have to pull it off somehow. You have to make it work, and I think that's where um, that's where you need a that's where you need really good crew. You need a great crew manager. That was Paul Cummins, who's still a great friend of mine, uh, who ran the ran the crew and 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 made sure all these shows took place. Um, incredibly difficult. I mean, dealing with it Italy in those days, it was, it, it it on many levels it functioned brilliantly, but on other levels it was it it was, you know, it was a bit fractured in places, and quite difficult to to uh, to deal with. Um, I and mean, the thing is, when we got there, the the gigs were on such a scale. I don't think they'd ever seen that scale of gigs before. You know, a hundred thousand people in the Turin football stadium. You know, that hadn't happened before. So they didn't really quite. They didn't really quite know what to do. To be honest, <laughs> they kind of didn't know what they were getting to, into either. I suppose. No, they didn't. I don't yeah. think they did. Um, we got out alive. That's all I would say about it. <laughs> yeah. There were, there were a number of occasions when I thought this is getting a bit hairy, but, uh, you know, we, we, we got through it and um, I'm pleased that we did because, you know, I've got some very, very fond memories of playing in Italy, despite how hectic it, it got on occasions. And we met some great people, mm -hmm. you know, lovely audiences. They're very passionate people. It was great. Yeah. So yeah. kind of on the other end of, um, the team i guess behind a band or things like that uh paul and ed also who's the band yeah. manager i believe what, yeah. what was like having that team because they were with you the whole time is that right in dire straits yeah they they, they grew up with us really okay uh, uh ed uh, i think we were the first band that ed had managed he was basically a um uh, a, a music a, a group booker you know for an agency and he he put us on the Talking Heads tour, but when he came to see us play, he 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 said, "I'd like to manage you." Well, I mean, he hadn't managed anybody before, but so we took a risk, and he took a risk, and um, it worked out very well. And and he turned he turned out to be, uh, you know, a really great manager, mm -hmm. you know, one of one of the great managers in history, I think. Um, he used to model himself on Peter Grant, which was probably not the best person to from Led Zeppelin, but he had a lot of respect for Peter, who was actually a sweetheart. I met him a couple of times. And uh, but um no, Ed and Paul grew up with us, and Paul was a uh you know a, an incredible organizer, uh, absolutely magnificent. So I mean he he was an incredible asset. He he would organize all the recording sessions as well as the live work as well. So they made a they made a very good team. Yeah, it's all about teamwork. At the end of the day, you've got and you've got to get on with each other. Okay, you're going to fall out over some things, but ultimately your aim is to get that band on the road, get that band recorded, get everything running sweetly. That's the gig, you know. Sure. And sure. everybody works twenty four seven to make that happen, you know. So Ed had not managed before. No, I don't. Was think there so. just? a grit or something about him that you guys felt was a good fit or. Well, I think he, I, I think he had, I was going to, I was going to say, I think he had balls, you know, he just, he would go into an office and say, I want this and I want that. I think he realized that he was going to be taking on when he, when he heard the record, I think he got a feeling that it was going to, I mean, if you ever feel like where you've got to go with your instinct. And I think he thought that we were probably going to be, I don't think he had any idea it was going to get, we're going to get to the heights that it did get to, but 
he was partly responsible for making that happen. Let's put it that way. Yeah, he had grit. He had, he was funny. Um, and uh, he would just literally go to the record company and, and demand whatever he wanted. Sometimes he got it. Um, not always, but he, he, he made damn sure he was shouting for the band. You know, sure. and that's what you need. You need somebody to shout your corner. Sure. Well, that's cool. Was, that's cool. That... Very good manager. Very good manager. You know, yeah. got a lot of respect for him. Yeah. Um, also, you mentioned Woodwarf. I thought that was interesting that you guys often went back there to practice for, was that up until Brothers in Arms, you guys would go back there to practice? Uh, that's a very good question. I think it was certainly we did we did the making movie stuff there. I think. Uh, no, no, we did the Love of a Gold stuff there. Okay. Because Alan had joined us by then, Alan Clark had joined us by then. Yes, I think it was just a good. We felt we felt safe there. We felt that we could create there. I think you, if you find a space where you're comfortable, and you can make things happen, uh, and it was very private. Nobody ever, nobody kind of knew it was there. <laughs> there was a half decent pub on the corner, which helps. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it just became a place where we felt we could. Um, we could work, and and that's that's partly. I, I'm pretty sure we did. We, we definitely did the making movie stuff there without Alan. There was just the four of us in there. I remember that, and I think we did it with Love of a Gold as well. Uh, but we might have rehearsed in another place as well. But you know, I, I, some things I've just forgotten. Sure. And I I, I just can't remember. I can't remember everything. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's neat that that place kind of evolved with you. It had to have been interesting to go back each time after you had another album and another tour, and you're going back yeah. to that place where you had started. And yeah, well, of course, it, when we when we were in the council flat, it was literally a five minute walk from there. But of course, we all then moved and bought a place each, you know, which was a bit further away. So it was a bit of a journey to get there in, mm -hmm. in the end. But um, yeah, it was, you know, it was all, it, it was, it, it's, it's funny how well you choose places. You just feel safe there. So you, you feel like you can work. I mean, that's the most important thing. It's like, I know certain places that I can work in now when I'm doing my own stuff, you know, um, where, where I feel uh, that I can be, I can make, I can make things happen if you like. Sure. Sure. Mm. So with um, practicing, uh, for an album, what was the ratio general, generally of songs that were rehearsed versus what were actually recorded? Um, it depended, really. I mean, on, on something like, let's just take Love of a Gold, for instance. I mean, we basically that Telegraph Road pretty much filled up half the album. Well, that was that we rehearsed that on the road in sound checks to put that all together. Um, I think I think there was maybe a couple of things we left off that, but I don't think they were particularly significant. We just wanted to do a different kind of album on that one, and, and Private Investigations was a complete experiment as well, which went through one or two different uh, shapes, I think, before we decided on that one. With that record, it was more what you took out than what you left in. Mm. Um, that sounds a bit odd, but that it's often the way when you're recording, you record a lot of stuff and then you take out what you don't need. Um, I, won't, I mean, I'm talking about once you've decided on the songs, but I, th I don't think we, we, I don't think we had, I do remember on, uh, I think it was on every street, there was a few things that got, um, got left off. Uh, and I think Mark used them later. I think changed them. I can't. I just can't remember, to be honest. I, most of the time, we would go in prepared with with the songs that, you know, we we we'd worked up, um, and got rid of the dead wood, if you like, before we got into the studio. That goes back to the, what I said earlier. You know, you 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 go in as prepared as you can be, uh, to make things happen. Don't you don't want to waste any time, you know, when you're in the studio because it's a very, very expensive place to 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 do to work in. Right. 
that makes sense. Yeah. And then, um, again, like how um, with Jack uh, Sony, I believe I'm saying his last name correctly. Yeah, Jack Sony. Yeah. Sony. Sony. Yeah, Sony. Um, that was, again, I just thought that was cool that you brought somebody in that was uh, not some huge name or something. And I loved Mark's mm-hmm. quote of sometimes it's nice to play Father Christmas. Uh, <laughs> well, Yes, well, I mean, the thing is, there again, you know, we were looking around for a guitar player because Hal left during the recording of, 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 of um, Brothers, and um, and Mark said, well, there's, there's this guitar player in New York who I know pretty well. He's a nice guy. He, he's a great player. I, he, he could cover this quite easily, and I think he'd get on with everybody. And Jack came out to, to uh, Montserrat, and uh, we liked him, and, you know, that was it, really. We didn't really need to try anybody else out because he just had to. He just had to play some guitar parts, you know, dance around a bit and sing a, sing some vocals. That's, that's right. Right. And right. he and of course he loved it. He, he loved it. He loved being. He loved being in a in a successful rock and roll band. Oh yeah, that had to have been such a thrill for those guys to. Yeah, yeah. Just yeah. Jump on that train. Well, we'd kind of grown up with it, so we weren't. You know, but anybody coming into a situation like that, I think would have, you know, I know Jack was very, very excited and was excited really for the whole tour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then that music shop was kind of a big part of the band too, wasn't it? Because didn't Mark yeah, Rudy, find it? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, well, Rudy, Rudy, um, uh, Rudy had he had he had the shop on um, forty. 40, it was 48 or 42nd, I can't remember now, and 5th or 6th. Not a very big shop, but he always used to get really great guitars. And and um, I think Mark was when Mark was living in New York then and he, and, and started to go and, into the shop quite a bit and met Rudy and they, they became very friendly. And so Rudy used to find guitars for him. And then he started making these pencil guitars, which Mark started using. Um, and uh, you know, I went down there and found some nice bass guitars and things. They really used to get the get the real quality mm-hmm. stuff, and he still does now. I mean, when the last time I was in New York, I went down to his shop in the village, and uh, I mean, it's like an Aladdin's cave um, of, of of guitars. I mean, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's just mouth watering when you go in there. It's dangerous yeah. to go in because you always find yourself <laughs> buying something you don't really need. You know what I mean? Uh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. But Jack, yeah, Jack was a, a, a not only a great guitar player, but he also was, a, a, I think he was quite a good, you know, he, he could fix guitars too, you know, if anything went wrong with them. So that was quite handy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And then uh, on every street, um, how did Vince Gill get involved to come in and record? <laughs> well, it's a good question. I'm still not quite sure about that, actually. I was a bit bemused that, you know, Mark wanted somebody else to sing the backing vocals on a couple of songs. I thought you've got you've got you've got three perfectly good singers in the band. I don't know why you want to get Vince Gill involved, but you know he did, and sounds great. And you know, I think it was because it was a country type thing that he wanted. You know, uh, that sort of you know country singer. And I think he obviously must have met him somewhere. I I don't know the details of that really, to be frank. So I didn't really go into it in the book. Sure. I, I, I think Mark must have met him somewhere or played with him or something. I don't know. I don't know. And they got on well. And I think we just sent the, we sent the tapes over. We sent something over and he just, he recorded on it. He didn't come to England. Okay. I was curious about that too. He probably just recorded in Nashville or something and bounced it over. Yeah, I think so. Of course it's now, it's much easier now. I don't know how we did it then. We must have sent over a tape or something. Or I don't know because, because on every street was recorded digitally as well. Okay. I don't know how that would work then. I just can't remember. I just can't remember some of these things. Yeah. Well, and I guess Paul Franklin too, another Nashville type well, guy. Franklin had done, I think Paul, had, uh, Mark had done some soundtrack work with Franklin, I think. Okay. I mean, he was, I have to say, one of the most extraordinary musicians I've ever worked with. Really? Yeah, absolutely. He's incredible. Incredible. Yeah. It was an absolute pleasure. I mean, because he was sitting behind me on the stage, 
every night. So I could hear him really, uh -huh. really well. And every single night he played something absolutely amazing. It so, was really yeah. cool to hear him add to those songs, to put a steel guitar on some of his songs that never yeah. had it before. And yeah, yeah. Because there's a live album with it, and yeah. it's really cool. It really added something to it. Oh, my God. I mean, his playing on some of those things was just ridiculous. I mean, and then he's he's doing a counter playing with Mark, you know, and they, they're they sharing solos, and it's like, oh, Jesus Christ. I mean, it was just something else. Yeah. I yeah. guess... Did Mark kind of hang around Nashville for a while there when he was with Chet Atkins and stuff? And maybe that's how some of those Nashville folks kind of got I brought in. So. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, we all know that Nashville is full of really great players. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's we all know that. So sure. the, there's no shortage of great players in Nashville. But um, yeah, I think I think Mark's time with with Chet was very very special. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, but I, I met him. He's a, he was a complete, total delightful man. Totally delightful. He came to London, I think, once or twice. And yeah, and very, and Mark introduced me to him. He's a very nice man. Yeah. And cool. what the playing they did together was, was incredible, I thought. Yeah. I yeah. Yeah. And then I was curious with your painting. Um, do you find it a totally different ball game from the music? Or do you find them kind of enmeshed with um, your creativity and your painting? Well, there's two different things, really. I mean, the creative side of it is obviously quite different because you are dealing with a different medium and a different form of expression. Uh, they, two have, they both have the same thing in common, music and art. You're trying to communicate in some kind of way with the outside world, whether it's through songwriting or whether it's painting a picture. Uh, so they have those two things in, in common. And you start with a blank piece of paper. You start when you're writing a song, you start with nothing. And when you start a painting, you're starting with nothing. And hopefully something's going to come out of it. Uh, obviously, the biggest difference is the fact you're doing it on your own, the painting. And, uh, you know, there's a you miss that. Well, it's a, just it's a, it's a it's a it's a solo endeavor paintings. But whereas music is often nearly always involves other people. Uh, which I think is, uh, which is, to my mind, I, 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 the wonderful part of it is the fact that you're actually playing with other great musicians. And I've got a little band I used around here, and they're, they're all local people. I've been playing with them now off and on for oh, five, maybe five, six, seven years or something. I can't remember now. And we've done a lot of work together. And so when we get together, it's, it's, it's really natural. Mm -hmm. For instance, we're doing a charity gig in, london in in march when we get back when we get back from cuba and uh you know we'll just sit down for a day and and we haven't played together for two months and it'll just be it'll just come fl all flooding back and everything will just sit nicely yeah for sure. so that, that that's that, that, i mean they're, they're two different things but you know art is is uh very important to me and i and i and i i spend my time either painting or or making music really so i'm very fortunate in that respect Mm -hmm. yeah. and so you recorded a new album over the covid lockdown is that yeah okay yeah yeah i started it before uh started writing it before the lockdown and I, in fact i started the book before the lockdown as well so the two things were running side by side um and uh yeah that's coming out i think on the 4th of march now Very um cool. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, number eight. So there might be a number nine. I don't know yet. but <laughs> That's awesome. And so uh, you recorded – sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, you go. Yeah. Uh, you recorded part of that at British Grove Studios? Well, I, 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 I mixed it there. I recorded, okay. I recorded some of it, actually, in the house here. Okay. And, and I recorded some of it in my – son-in-law's house down the road because he's a record producer and he one of his relations is a concert pianist so I, I had I did all the string work with him and but most of it was done at my keyboard player's studio which is about half an hour from here um, and we had to do it one at a time because of COVID we couldn't have anybody else out in the room right it was very weird 
Mm -hmm. uh, but we managed to get it sorted out and um yeah i'm very happy with it i'm very pleased with it actually uh and and uh, it's quite different from the others um they're all different they're always different sure very cool I'm, i I'm, i get excited every time an album comes out it's not it's not a biggest deal obviously when the straights used to book an album out, but this you know for me it's a it's a personal achievement so I'll, I'll keep doing it as long as it gives me pleasure oh yeah i look forward to it so are you so you're gonna do some dates in the uk to tour it? Yeah. yeah okay it's very difficult to tour in europe at the moment because we made a real mess of the brexit thing with uh bands bands being able to tour outside of the uk it's very very difficult in europe to go touring now it's not impossible but it's 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 made it made it much more difficult i see so I see. i'll leave that for a bit until the politicians have sorted it out <laughs> yeah but it's too stressful otherwise do you think you'll come to the u.s at all yeah, I'd love to come to the US. In fact, a Canadian promoter who used to look after us uh, years and years ago got hold of me the other day and said, "Would I like to come over?" I, 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 um, yeah, I'd, lo I'd, lo I'd love to do something there. I mean, goodness knows how 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 it would work. I mean, uh, uh, I, I'm I'm not really known as a solo artist in in, in the states, um, and uh, you know, I. I it's so it's, it's difficult when you when you just because that's a big that's a big financial commitment to get mm -hmm. over there but the the ways of doing it now i mean i wouldn't i wouldn't bring any equipment over apart from a guitar and everything else would be hired i mean you wouldn't bother and you'd hire the crew over there you wouldn't bother bringing your own really mm -hmm. and you I mean, because i did this festival last uh well in in july was it july this year i don't know whether we talked about it the other day but the only so. way I could do it was by, uh, um, it was in Berlin, and I, I said I can't really do it because I don't, I can't. This Brexit thing is making it difficult to get the equipment over. So we, we just decided to rent all the equipment in Berlin, rent three three main crew members, and we just jumped on a plane with our guitars, and that was it. We rented everything: the drum kit, the keyboards, the bass amps, everything. We rented the whole lot, and it was completely fine yeah dead easy dead yeah. easy yeah. i guess you don't have to worry about shipping logistics and all of that in that case oh, it's a nightmare see. it's a nightmare you've got to fill it you've got to fill in a million pieces of paper to in order to go and play a gig it's just it's too much effort mm -hmm. you know and um yeah I, I, that's not going to happen for a while i think they've got to sort them once they sort it out then i'll then we'll get something else organized